Welcome to the Reginald F. Lewis Museum's 2021 Kwanzaa Celebration. Now, this year's Kwanzaa Celebration is a little different because it's virtual, but I guarantee you, you'll feel like you're right here in the building. Kwanzaa is a cultural celebration. It's not a religious celebration, and it's an opportunity for African Americans to connect to their African roots. It's an opportunity to join with family, with community, and really focus on those things that matter. There are seven principles that make up Kwanzaa. Umoja, unity, Kujichakalia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujama, cooperative economics, Nia, purpose, Kaumba, creativity, and Imani, faith. Now, when I think of those principles, I think about the people and the stories that we are chronicling here in the museum, and they actually are depictions of those principles. But most of all, Reginald F. Lewis is the personification of those principles. Now, the Kwanzaa celebration you are about to see includes the premier Kwanzaa Kids Party video with culture queen Jessica Hebron. And there is also a conversation with filmmaker M.K. Asante and journalist Lisa Snowden McRae discussing his film, The Black Candle. And finally, a segment about food with Chef David Thomas, formerly of Ida B's restaurant, discussing the great Karimu feast during Kwanzaa. This program will be available beginning today, December 28th, through the 1st of January. It'll be on all of our social media platforms, so please dial in. And please engage your children, your friends, and other generations because that's what Kwanzaa is about. It's about community, it's about connection, it's about family. So happy Kwanzaa and happy new year. Fist up high and turn it all around. Take it to the right, a rock side to side, and shake it down to the ground. Just slide and then stop. Slide and then stop. Slide, slide, slip and slide. That's right, do the Kwanzaa slide. You're cordially invited to the party of the year. Come on, come on, it's a family affair. Dressed to impress in your red, black, and green. Looking like African kings and queens. Do you know what Kwanzaa means? It means first fruits in Swahili. Habari Ghani. What's the news? Meet, Meet us on, on the, the floor, floor with your dancing shoes. Come on, everybody, and show your pride. And do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number. Yes, Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community. Yeah, you know the vibe. Party don't stop seven days and nights. Do the Kwanzaa slide. Take it to the left. Put your fist up high and turn it all around. Take it to the right, a rock side to side, and shake it down to the ground. Just slide and then stop. Slide and then stop. Slide, slide, slip and slide. That's right, do the Kwanzaa slide. Unity, purpose, self-determination Starts with your family and then with the nation You gotta have faith and creativity Collective work, responsibility Cooperative economics is a topic is a topic. Or how you spend the money in your pocket, in your pocket. Do the Kwanzaa slide, just rock it Whatever you do, just don't stop it Take it to the left Put your fist up high and turn it all around Take it to the right A rock side to side and shake it down to the ground Just slide and then stop Slip and slide, that's right, do the Kwanzaa slide. Come on, everybody, and show your pride. And do the Kwanzaa slide. Seven is the magic number. Yeah, it's Kwanzaa time. Family, culture, community. Yeah, you know the vibe. Party don't stop seven days and nights. Do the Kwanzaa slide.
young women, young men of color. We add our voices to the voices of your ancestors who speak to you over ancient seas and across impossible mountaintops. Come up from the gloom of national neglect. You have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame, bright beyond the telling of it. You are the best we have. You are all we have. You are what we have become. It is time to remember Do you know what Kwanzaa is? Yes, it's Christmas. It's about love. African Christmas, you know. I don't really know nothing about Kwanzaa. Do you know what Kwanzaa is? No, I don't. I really never heard nothing about it. I don't know what Kwanzaa is either. Kwanzaa is when the black people tries to pull together to do everything for themselves. It's a celebration of black people. It's unity amongst the black people. Seven day holiday. I think it's a Jewish holiday or something like that. I know all the seven days of I don't know all the seven days, but I know some of the some of the days which you celebrate with seven candles. Like seven candles that you have to light. Three green, three black, one red, I think. I just don't know. What what is it? It's some holiday or like Africa. So what is Kwanzaa? Educate me. Today we're going to we're going to talk about an African celebration uh, that is celebrated all over the African world. That African holiday that we're talking about is Kwanzaa. Now, what significance does Kwanzaa have to African people born here in America? There are days, this is one of them, when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. My name is Lisa Snowden McRae. I'm a journalist here in Baltimore City, and I'm here with filmmaker, academic, and author M.K. Asante. Thanks. Welcome. Nice. Thanks for having me. When black people were brought to this country, we were, we had a lot of things thrust on us without our permission, and that includes holidays. Mm. However, Kwanzaa is a holiday that we created for ourselves, by ourselves. And today I'm going to talk to MK, and we're going to learn more about the origins of Kwanzaa, why it's such an integral part of the black cultural landscape, and what it means at this moment of political upheaval. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoyed watching your documentary, um, The Black Candle. And I wanted to kind of start just on a personal level. The Black Candle is about Kwanzaa. I'm interested in knowing about how you celebrate Kwanzaa. Like if there are any special things that you do with your family, whether there are any traditions that you've kind of added. Well, you know, definitely a um, couple things. You know, again, thanks for having me. Um, you know, it's an honor. Um, it's an honor to be here at the museum as well. Um, thanks to Terry. Um, but I want to say, you know, when I was young, in fact, I was about second or third grade. I was in school, and my school it was around holiday time. You know, my parents had, you know, put me on the Kwanzaa, and it was something that we, you know, um, celebrated in our home. And we, the school, they were doing a, uh, something in the auditorium, and the principal was up there, and they said, we want to say happy, Merry Christmas to everybody, and everybody here. We want to say happy Hanukkah to everybody. And then, that was like it. And this was like, you know, a while ago, <laughs> um, uh, 80s. And so, I remember thinking to myself, what, what about Kwanzaa? So I raised my hand, and it wasn't like a setting where you raise your hand, you know what I mean? It was like the principal was just talking. And so I raised my hand 
and they were like, you know, Kamala? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, what about Kwanzaa? <laughs> and that's kind of like, you know, when I think about even this film, The Black Candle, it's, it's me being like, what about Kwanzaa, right, to the world? But that was like one of the first experiences that I remember like, you know, being intentional about advocating for Kwanzaa and for my people, you know? Um, and that was in, in like around second grade or so. And with this film, you know, actually what we wanted to do, because Kwanzaa is a cultural creation, right? It's something that was created by people of African descent to celebrate people of African descent. And we wanted to, with this film, create a tradition. And so part of the Black Candle is creating a holiday tradition. So I've always had this mantra that if you make an observation, you have an obligation. Mm. That's like my artistic mantra. That's what kind of drives and informs a lot of the decisions I make. So with this film, you know, part of the reason why we made it was we made an observation that there was no film about Kwanzaa, no definitive, comprehensive story about this beautiful holiday. That, That's crazy. Yeah. So it was like, <laughs> why isn't there? And, and I, I've had this question a lot in my life as an artist, just but as just a human. And the question is, why isn't there blank? You know, mm -hmm. and the answer is always because you didn't make it yet. <laughs> so like literally the answer to the question of why, how come there's no film about Kwanzaa? We, you ain't make it yet, you know? So we knew we were tasked to do this. And one of the things we wanted to do, you asked about holiday traditions. Well, with this film, we wanted to create a new holiday tradition or we wanted to create a holiday tradition that people could incorporate into what they already do for Kwanzaa. And that's what's happened. So for example, all around the country every year since this film has come out, this film is shown, you know, as part of Kwanzaa celebrations in homes and in institutions and wherever. And so this film now is a part of how people learn about Kwanzaa, how people think about it. So, yeah. And the film is almost what, like 20, 10, 10 20 years old? Yeah, it's about 10, 11 years old. So that's like somebody's whole childhood. <laughs> well, yeah, kid, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, our children, um, they, they would, you know, understand that from that perspective but you know obviously 10 years in the scope of you know film and the scope of kind of like what we've been going through as a as a people and a culture it's not that much time i mean 10 years ago it wasn't that different yeah. <laughs> i want to talk about how could you you mentioned that the film is comprehensive and it is there's there's artists there are regular people young people old people poets musicians so many people that you talk to to get different perspectives for this piece how did that come together uh so you know my style of filmmaking um is very much hands-on it's very much um you know when i when i make a film i'm totally immersed it's an immersive experience for me so it means that i'm with the people like you know every time you saw celebrations going on in paris or jamaica or wherever in the film you know i'm in there you know i'm there i'm i'm in that space and so and when i'm in those spaces i'm traveling in those spaces talking to people it's really important for me to give the story context mm -hmm. so for example you know um when i was shooting a black candle i often was shooting with myself and um you know i would be in the streets of Chicago, Philly, Baltimore, LA, wherever, Accra, London. And I would go up to people and be like, yo, what you know about Kwanzaa? <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, so that's literally what you were doing. Like there were people that were there that were saying, I don't know. Like, there was, and, that was like, like if, I'm pulling, if I'm shooting in Baltimore, right? Someone's gonna ask me, yo, what you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, yo, you wanna be in a movie? <laughs> Let me ask you some questions. And um, a lot of times it happens organically. I'm a people person, so I end up talking to people in general. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's like, oh, you want to be in a movie? Or, you know, let's, you know, roll camera. Because it's really important for me. That's, that's so much part of, I mean, the, the Black Candle starts out literally on Poppleton Street in Baltimore mm -hmm. with someone saying, So what is Kwanzaa? Educate me. What's Kwanzaa? Educate me out of a window. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that happened because we were doing an interview and we we're doing an interview with someone who knew about Kwanzaa. And a lady out the window says, what y'all doing? <laughs> and I 
we point the camera at the window and I'm like, we're doing a documentary about Kwanzaa. And she's like, well, what's Kwanzaa? Educate me. And that was just a natural, organic moment. And, you know, when you're, when you're making a film, people see you making it and they want to know. It becomes an educational experience for everybody involved. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, and so that's, that's kind of how that happened, right? It's just, you know, um, being organically in those places and talking to people. The other part of it is being intentional about making sure that the film is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make sure that the film was intergenerational, that people from all ages and walks of life would be able to relate to it. And so it was important for me to make sure we go out, yo, let's go get some, some young bucks talking about this. Let's go get some old heads talking mm -hmm. about this. You know, we wanna make sure we, we do that. And we wanna make sure that everyone in the film isn't, you know, some scholar or isn't some you know famous musician or something but that there's a really a, a mix of people it almost reminds me of a barbershop where it's just like at my barbershop which is actually here in baltimore i mean anybody could be in there you never know who's in there and we're all everybody's in the same space having the same conversations and there's no hierarchy yeah. and that's how I, I look at the you know shooting film yeah and I thought it was so important that you did, you know, you very easily could have just been like, okay, this is Kwanzaa, but you did lay out, this is the environment that creates the need for Kwanzaa, where you show people being like, I don't know, or kids in school being yeah. like, I never learned to love myself. So yeah. like, I think you do a great job of, of creating context yeah. and then presenting this important story. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was important to show where Kwanzaa came from like why would you create a holiday you know what I mean yeah. well there's a reason right and part of the reason you, you see it still now right in terms of people's consciousness and how they feel about their own origins and where they come from and their history and their people so it's, it was really created to counteract that and you can see like I said you can still see it when you talk to young people today and you still see why it's still here and why it's still important that really that leads very well into my next question, which was this film was put together in 2009, I believe you said. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot has happened since 2009. <laughs> we have had, you know, escalating anti black violence. We've had I mean, this has always been this has never been a country that has been safe for us. But to me, I know it feels like. In the last few years, there has been a shift where people felt like saying it with their chest. People felt like being more hateful out loud. Um, I'm interested in hearing from you, like, what do you think has changed as far as like Kwanzaa in that, at, in that backdrop? When we see people that are out here openly criticizing like cultural history, education in schools, or people out here feeling comfortable to march with no masks, to say how, you know, white supremacists they are. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, in a lot of ways, I guess I would probably challenge the notion that there's an escalating, mm -hmm. you know, um, rate of that. That I would probably say that in, instead of an escalating rate, technology has changed and mm -hmm. shifted in the way that we are able to consume information. Um, you know, when I look at what's happening now, and I asked myself, was this happening when I was growing up? Well, of course it was. But first of all, sometimes you would never hear about it. So there was, imagine for all the police brutality that we see on a cell phone, mm -hmm. imagine how much even now we don't see. But imagine how much back then, right before the advent of like digital technology, it, I mean, you could tell someone your story, yo, the police did this to me, but it's like, you know what I mean? Right. Nobody's gonna, you know, it, it's always been happening. That's really good th point. These, your neighbors or whoever's neighbors and the things that they're saying and doing, and that's always been happening. Mm -hmm. But we weren't able to record it before and document it and upload it and then share it with the world and, and have it be something where people can say, that's wrong and, and, and you're, and give it a name and a label. So. In a lot of ways, I, I see what you're talking about, and I understand how. And and I may be, you know, this is something I think is is worthy of discussion. It's not something that I feel like, you know. I'm a hundred percent on. It's just that I don't know if it's actually escalating or if it's just that the way that we're able to view it mm -hmm. has changed 
and made it a lot more accessible um, and a lot easier to also espouse that racism. Mm -hmm. So an anonymous comment on YouTube, an anonymous comment on Instagram, I get all these people sending me, you know, anonymous hate mail on these mess on these platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's anonymous, you, you, you right. know, <laughs> it's, it's easy, you know, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's just an ease to, you know, there's a easy, there's the barrier to entry is lower to be, you know, to be a racist online, for example, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to do anything. Before, back in the day, to get, you know, you had to do, do something, but now it's so easy. So, so I think there's, that has changed um, more than anything, mm -hmm. technology and our, ex our exposure to all that is happening because before you would hear about something that happened right we heard about you know what happened to bird in texas or we have mm -hmm. heard about what happened to king in la but you know now we every day we're seeing so many names and so many stories for mm -hmm. people all over and mainly it's, it is because of social media and cell phones i mean it's really allowed us so in a lot of ways it's been helpful to show people what's going on people who maybe didn't understand how bad it was or how pervasive it was before mm -hmm. you know what i mean like this happens every day yeah. literally every day you know what i mean and it didn't just start when the iphone came out yeah. it's been happening every day yeah so it kind of you know so i think it's it's been helpful to show people that i think it's the danger of it is just the desensitization because ultimately if you are constantly exposed to you know um black bodies and death and you know violence it it it, it kind of numbs you you yeah, know and absolutely. it could be numbing um i don't think it's, it could be numbing to to us though yeah yeah and i think even to take that your point which i think is a great one and flip it to if there are places to look for hope. Even your film now, like I, I know we were talking a little bit earlier about how you have physical copies. But we don't <laughs> even need those anymore. Like your film and the work of, of people like you is also accessible. Yeah. It like is. my daughter can can go on TikTok and yeah. see young young girls that are saying that their hair is beautiful, their skin is beautiful, yeah. this is how I do my hair. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like that's also, it's like there's a double-edged sword there. Definitely, I mean, with technology, you know, you can, you know, there's gunpowder to make fireworks and there's gunpowder to make weapons, you know. Yeah. There's a, one is a celebratory thing and one is, you know, war. So it's, there's always that duality with technology, you know, it, it can be used for however we use, we, it's really about us, yeah. you know, um, what we do with it. But that's kind of how I see it, it's just technology has really shifted. Um, but the people, you know, um, have more access to information now than ever. Mm -hmm. So the people have leverage yeah. that we didn't always have. Just like the workers have a little bit of leverage. You see, everyone's not going back to work. <laughs> <laughs> People say, uh, I'm not going back to work. Yeah. <laughs> it's not worth it. So unless the employer is, you know, stepping it up and doing this and doing that, because they says, we have a little bit of leverage as workers now. Workers are feeling, and so I think, again, the people with all the access to information, and now you see musicians and rappers now and artists have leverage with mm -hmm. technology. They don't need to sign a deal so soon. You know what I mean? Right, because right. they can use the media, social media and use the power of technology to, to, to not be so reliant on big corporations. Yeah, they can build their own audience. Exactly, yeah. Um, so you wear many hats. You're not just a filmmaker, yeah. you're also an author. Today I wore my <laughs> AFI hat, which is American Film Institute. They did a special, uh, Shout out to the brother I am Duran who did this special uh, AFI. He was a graduate student at American Film Institute, and they did a special honoring of the Black Candle last year. And nice. uh, he made this special hat. But yeah, so you were saying I, I wear many hats. <laughs> <laughs> One of your hats is teacher. So you interact with young people every day. People that are like, really in a place where they're really just forming opinions about who they are and the place where they live. What are the attitudes that you're seeing from your students about 
blackness, about Kwanzaa, about celebrations like that? Well, I'm a professor at Morgan State University. I've been teaching there since 2006. And, um, and the film came out, I remember, in 2009 or something. So they kind of, some of the, the students at Morgan actually helped make the film. So wow. for example, Ryan Bowens is one of my former students who's now a filmmaker. And he uh, was one of the people who, you know, when you see those interviews with Amiri Baraka and all those people, he was right there with me going to those interviews, shoot, shooting, doing sound on the streets with me. Um, you know, so, uh, so they were a part of it. What I've always seen from them is really a desire, a hunger, and an eagerness to learn about themselves and celebrate themselves. I don't know, you know, obviously I've only been a professor at Morgan. Um, I was also uh, had an appointment in India, but in terms of America and U.S. and black folks, I've, I've only been a professor at Morgan. And what I've, I've noticed is that you know, and it's all it's always been constant, is that the Morgan students just always have this sense of pride and sense of self and identity and like I said, a hunger to know about themselves. I just see it. And uh, I know they all take you know, African diaspora classes mm -hmm. and there just seems to be this, you know, cultural um ethos and you know education that surrounds the university that people gravitate to i also see it at other universities my my uh little cousin is at howard now mm -hmm. I see it there um and i've gone to howard many times to lecture and other hbcus obviously so i see i see i see the people being hungry for the information and that's why as a content maker i think it's a great time you know because people want content Mm -hmm. You know, that's really the problem is there's not enough content. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are hungry. We don't, it's like you're serving the food. It's just, it's, the people are still hungry. There's, there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of information. There's so much that we haven't learned. There's so much we don't know. There's so many, we talked about the Black Candle was made because there was no film about Kwanzaa yet. Mm -hmm. Well, think about, there's no film. Ida B. Wells is sitting right here, you know. Um, you know, I'm looking around at all these great, Figures, you know, Reginald Lewis. You mm -hmm. said, "What's Reginald Lewis's movie?" I mean, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, not just the the documentary, the biopic, the whole thing. I mean, there's none of our stories have been told. When you really put it in perspective, we haven't even told like one percent of our yep. story. I know that Toni Morrison said the reason why she wrote is because the book that she wanted to read had not been written. Yeah. Definitely. And, and I know for me, I'm, I'm a journalist. And the thing that I tell students when I talk to them is like, there's no magical like fairy that comes down and says, you are now officially a journalist or you are now officially a filmmaker. Like you can just start. <laughs> like yeah. you, you know, the kids that you're talking to now can literally start like and you said that they have start telling our stories right now because the work is needed. I'm even thinking right. about a kid, a college kid being able to interact with Amiri Baraka, who's no longer even here, being able to hear Maya Angelou's voice, who's not even here, like that's such an impactful thing and a thing that really can carry on. <laughs> I showed the black candle in my black film class at Morgan State a couple uh, weeks ago. It was actually in the beginning of October. And um, we watched it. We always usually watch it around that time to talk about Kwanzaa and the holiday. And it's in the context, obviously, of black film. There's a lot of important people in the film. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had mentioned to them that after that showing was, I said, look at all the people in this film, okay? So you've got uh, uh, new ancestors, right, mm -hmm. in, in the Black Candle. When I look at the Black Candle, I see new ancestors. You got Dr. Maya Angelou, right, mm -hmm. who's the narrator and the co-writer of this film. She's no longer with us. How did this film even get made? This film got made because wealthy, black business people wrote big checks mm -hmm. to make this movie. Dr. Walter Lomax, who was Dr. Martin Luther King's medical doctor and who later became a very sensible businessman, he was the one that wrote me the check to make The Black Candle. He's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Maya Angelou, Dr. Walter Lomax, Amiri Baraka, the great poet and my mm -hmm. mentor, is no longer with us. He's in The Black Candle. Baba Chuck Davis, the great dancer and choreographer, He's no longer with us. Granny Franny, who's in the film, she's no longer with us. Philip Freeline, the architect who designed this museum that we're wow. in right now, 
is in the black candle. He's no longer with us. Um, there's so many people. And I had showed that film in the you know, beginning of October. And my mom, the great choreographer who's in that film as well, passed away on October 12th. Mm -hmm. Right after I showed that film, my mom passed away. And so she's a new ancestor. And so she's, a, so when I look at the black candle, it's so important. It reminds me of the importance of why we have to tell our stories, why we have to get out our phones and record, get out your camera and record, jot it down, get it down. Because Granny Franny, Maya Angelou, Amir Baraka, Walter Lomax, Baba Chuck Davis, Phil Freeline, these stories, if we don't get them, then they, where do they go? We, we, we have to preserve, we have to, you know, my name actually means keeper of tradition. So mm. it's about being a custodian of this information and the legacy. So yeah, very deep uh, when I look at all the people that are no longer with us um, in the black candle. Um, but then there's so many that are, are still with us, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, but um, but there's a lot of people who who are no longer with us in the Black Candle, new ancestors, and um, you know the Black Candle is a place where they all, you, you know, like you say, where else would you find all those people, you know, congregated in that mm -hmm. one place, right? You know, rappers and dudes on the block and. You know, ladies coming from church, just all <laughs> these people, you know, just professors and scholars and famous people and uh, kids. I mean, everyone just in the same space. That's what the black candle is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, my last question. Yep. I wanted to t kind of touch about touch on all the people that you have. I want to talk about specifically Pan-Africanism. Yeah. And again, like this is a, a moment if if not a moment where it where it is more violent, it feels to me, you know, it feels like something where I'm really making an effort to look towards scholars, like, like Pan-African scholars, black writers. Like I'm, I'm looking to learn from those things because I know that we have to figure out how to survive somehow. Yeah. I'm curious about what you saw about or what you know about the, the African, Pan-African intellectual community, maybe back when you, when you, we're filming this and maybe the things that you've seen change since then if anything yeah that's an interesting question i mean my perspective on that is is going to be you know remember um you know i was i was raised uh by you know my father and my mother in philadelphia who were you know uh, afrocentrists mm -hmm. pan-africanists you know Garveyites, Du Bois, every, I mean, I grew up, you know, every day in my house there was, it was Pan, it was, the conversations that were talked about was Pan-Africanism. It was blackity black boy. <laughs> Real black. <laughs> I mean, you know, you probably heard about the, the move bombing, mm -hmm. you know, that happened in Philadelphia. Well, you know, those members and survivors, people like Ramona Africa, they would be in, in our house, you wow. know. Um, Sonia Sanchez, um, Bobby Seale, uh, all of the, uh, you know, Kwame Ture, these were people that they were just in my house. And so uh, it's always been a part of my life and my reality and understanding of everything. And mm -hmm. so I didn't really, I haven't noticed, I guess, any, any differences because it's always, it's a personal thing. It's like, I'm not necessarily seeing trends or things like that or seeing mm -hmm. how certain things might be moving because for me it's it's just a personal thing it's just a, the way that i see the world it's not necessarily a social thing even though it's obviously very social i think for me the the biggest thing is there's a lot of misinformation out there now with the technology we mm -hmm. talked about it does make it easier also to create confusion <laughs> because like it's easy so, to, so finding the right information so I think that like back in the day it seemed a little bit easier to find the organizations or the group that was like you know now like like you say you could just create something right now tonight called panafricannetwork.com mm -hmm. or panafrican you know all, and it could be totally fake 
Yeah. It could be like a counter thing. It could be, you know, people who are white supremacists doing this to get information on people. So it's like a lot of yeah. trickery and misinformation and deception and kind of, I just feel like you have to be more savvy now. Yeah. Like everyone has to be more savvy. It's like when my grandma is like, searching for things on google and she clicks on like the ads i'm like no grandma that's an ad like <laughs> you, you can't click on that like she's like but it said i'm like i i know it said <laughs> that but they're just trying to get you grandma so it, it's about us being savvy and, and you know and having more curated spaces yeah. and when i say curated it just means like where are you getting the information from um what's the filtration process for how that information gets to the people because i think like a museum like this i'm looking around and i'm i'm so impressed with all the art the reason why though is because there's a curator right. <laughs> and it's not just everything it's yeah, yeah, yeah. someone who understands a culture who's rooted in it who is selecting things that they know are going to speak and further that and so mm -hmm. i think it's really important that we you know strengthen and support those organizations those agencies those entities that are curating our culture and and weed out like the misinformation and the all that kind of stuff because a lot of it can get really um deceptive i mean yeah. even bringing it back to the discussion of kwanzaa and like being in those spaces like you learned because you heard from your parents yeah. or you heard from elders where like there's a there's a limit to what you can just go online and you still need yeah, kind of that community, guidance and yeah, community, community. Yes, that's and a, I learned that's also exactly I'll, as you see in the black candle, I learned from Deb Prez and Common and Most and Talib and like people like that you know um, mm -hmm. who were MCs who would rap about things that a lot of times I didn't know about um, like when Common made a song for Asada, I didn't know who Asada Shakur was. And so it made me look it up. And then I was like, oh my God. Then I read <laughs> Asada Shakur's book and it was probably to this day the most profound book I've ever read, you know? So that's from a song, from a rapper, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's kind of like, that's why in the, in the film you see there's music as part of what makes, Kwan, like, what makes Kwanzaa go. Like all those rappers were putting stuff in their lyrics to add fuel to that fire yeah. yeah well thank you so much thank for the you film. so much thank you so much for talking to me today Th thank you so much um, and, I, and I just want to thank everyone who you know was involved in the film um, there's so hundreds of people um, who made that film possible and especially here locally in Baltimore so many people will see themselves see people they know um, places they know and you know without Baltimore that film would not be what it is yeah. All right. Thank you so much to the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. Hope you guys have a happy Kwanzaa. Peace. some of the symbols that are really important. So the first thing, of course, is the mkeka, which is the mat. And that represents the foundation. 
And then of course you have the Uguzo Saba, which is the seven principles. And you've got the red, black, and green candles, which we're gonna set up. So the red candles stand for the blood, and the red candles always go first, okay? You make sure you get those in there. And I'll give you a quick little Kwanzaa tip. When you're looking to get your black candle, um, sometimes they can be hard to find. So the best time to shop for your black candle is actually during Halloween. And then you got your green, oh, black stands, so you got red stands for the blood. And these colors are coming from the Pan-African flag, which is called a bandera. And you see the colors of Kwanzaa are red, black, and green. So your candles are red, black, and green too. You got red stands for the blood, black stands for the people. This is the unity candle. And of course you've got your green. Green stands for the land, okay? And Kwanzaa means first fruits. And so one of the things that's really important is to have lots of fresh fruits on the table. So I'm gonna get some fresh fruits for our table. One of the things I want you to be mindful about when you're setting up your Kwanzaa table is to see how many black-owned businesses you can support in trying to prepare your Kwanzaa table. So Kwanzaa means first fruits. And so one of the things that we're gonna do is put all of your favorite fruits on the table. I've got some mangoes, some apples, some uh, you can put some vegetables on there too. I've got some sweet potatoes, um, more apples. I like to put apples on the table because you can always find red and green apples, which always go with the colors of Kwanzaa. And then, um, the children always love, I've never been to a Kwanzaa event where the kids don't say, can I have a piece of fruit? So it's always great to have your Kwanzaa fruit. Now this is the Unity Cup, the Kekomba Cha Umoja. And the Unity Cup is what we use to pour libations and, um, and also to, to celebrate um, unity in the family. So you'll have your Unity Cup and you know you can get really creative with supporting black owned businesses and artisans who make these beautiful, beautiful things that you can collect over the year to get ready for your Kwanzaa table. So I think I'll put this right over here. Yeah, so you can see it. And then we've got something that's really important, the corn, Kwanzaa corn. Now, the corn represents the children. And you put the amount of corn on the table based on how many children you have in your family. And if you don't have any children in your family right now, they can represent the future generations. So you can put two. Um, I don't have this many children in my family, but I have a lot in my life. So <laughs> I'm gonna put lots of corn on the table. Um, and of course, you know, you can get really creative with your colors. So the red, the black, the green. Um, also think about like your, as you're decorating for the holidays, just like you would for any other holiday, think about how you can really bring in the spirit of Kwanzaa uh, with African art. Uh, this is actually a drum that my father-in-law uh, made for me um, and my husband. And this is a picture of me at, and my dad and my sister and my mom, I think, was taking a picture at my first Kwanzaa. And so, um, here in Maryland. And so I want to think, I want you to think about family. You know, Kwanzaa is about family, culture, and community. How can you incorporate your family, your culture, and your community right here on the Kwanzaa table? And of course, we're celebrating, even though Kwanzaa is an African American holiday, uh, we still always honor um, Mother Africa. And so all the different things that you can have to represent that, this is a great time to bring those things and put them close to you at the table. So we're still getting set up and getting ready, but it's beginning to look a lot like Kwanzaa. Uh. Happy Kwanzaa! I'm Culture Queen, and I'm on the scene today here with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland, African American History and Culture. And today we are doing something real special. We're gonna get ready to do some Kwanzaa cooking. And guess what? We're here with the Heirloom Food Group with our amazing, powerful black owned chefs. We have Chef David and Chef Tanya Thomas. These amazing chefs are with Heirloom Food Group here in Northeast Baltimore, where we are residents. And I'm so excited to say, hey, hey. <laughs> so, so we're gonna be doing Kwanzaa cooking today to help you get ready for the Karama, which means feast in Swahili. And that is where we are going to be cooking all of the African-American foods and African foods of the 
diaspora to celebrate Kwanzaa and bring our culture to our table. Kwanzaa is about family, culture, and community. And cooking is a really awesome way to practice all the Kwanzaa principles like moja, unity, creativity, kaumba, and collective work and responsibility, ujima. So we're gonna do that today and I'm hoping to help a little bit too. Absolutely. All right. You ready to start? Yeah. All right. So we're going to start with making our version of some Liberian collard greens. So we have some fresh collard greens grown locally here in Maryland, maybe 15, 20 minutes from here on a local farm, um, and the peppers and onions as well. So I'm going to have you pick them. Let me show you how to do it really quickly. If you just grab the stem here and pull the leaves apart and just pull it right down the back. So while you're doing that, I'm going to slice up some red pepper and onion and that's gonna go with our Liberian greens. And we also have a little bit of butter. I'm sorry, we're not gonna use butter, we're gonna use oil. We're gonna do some fresh garlic, some salt, pepper, and sugar, and some other spices. Um, a really unique blend of what we uh, do with our greens here. So Chef Tanya, can you tell me a little bit more about your favorite Kwanzaa principle? My favorite Kwanzaa principle is Nia, purpose. Um, I feel like everyone has a purpose in this life, um, and that's why I always was a fan of that particular one. And every year I look at um, when Kwanzaa comes around and that day comes, I say, well, what is my purpose for this year? I, always, I have a purpose in life, but what is my purpose for this coming year? And laying that out, um, that is my favorite principle. I love all of them and tie into all of them, but Nia, if someone had, if I had to pick one, Nia is the one. You know, my wife and I, we've been together for a long time, so we share the same passion and vision. So Nia is probably the most prominent one in our lives because... We are purpose driven. We do this work for our people and um, I don't think you can have a much better purpose than that. Um, what we're doing is trying to educate and uplift our people. So purpose is probably the most powerful one to me too. All right, so we are going to do, um, use a technique uh, that is very uh, French influenced. So it's called blanching and shocking. And what, the reason why I'm doing that is it cuts down on the cook time of the collars. Everybody knows that collard greens take a long time to cook, right? Forever. So if you really want to cut down on that time, um, but I'm giving you guys a little tip. So we're going to take these fresh collards and we're going to blanch them in hot water. Yeah. So now that we've blanched the fresh collards in hot water, we're now going to shock them in cold water. This is called blanching and shocking. This is a technique that's used in restaurants primarily, um, but I'm quite sure our ancestors were privy to this technique as this goes back for many, many years. But in essence, what we're doing is we're taking it from the hot water into the cold water. What it does is it keeps the integrity of the green while stopping the cooking process. So we still have a beautiful, fresh, looking collard green, even though in essence it's been par cooked. So then what we will do with this is we'll take it out of the water, we'll dry it off, we'll lay them out, and we'll cut them, and then we'll go back in the pot with our pot liquor and all of our vegetables, and that will start the process of making our Liberian green. Marvelous Maryland is known for our seafood. You know, everybody comes to Maryland for our seafood. But this Kwanzaa, I gave Chef a creative Kaumba challenge to spice it up a bit. And I want to see what you came Challenge up with. Challenge accepted. Okay. So we are ready. So a lot of people don't know about the other things that Maryland is known for in terms of food. So I want to take you back a little bit. So today we're going to prepare um, some beautiful duck legs and we're going to jerk them. So taking us to the Caribbean, to the Maryland shore. And the reason why we're talking about uh, duck is because back in the antebellum era, the late 1800s, Duck was very prominent in Maryland. Very specifically, the canvasback duck is a very sought after variety that migrates from here to Canada. Um, and there's also some that migrate over to the West Coast. Very well sought after duck. Nice fat content to the meat ratio. Um, this is not the canvasback duck, but it's the closest duck that we could find here in Maryland that represents that. And this is a mallard duck. Has almost the same fat um, composition, but a really beautiful meat color. So we're gonna jerk that today. Um, and that's kind of our twist on it. Maryland is a well-known state for a lot of seafood, but a lot of people don't know about the canvasback duck and how it was highly sought after. And most people don't aren't aware of the fact that Baltimore is one of the more 
prominent food cultures in the country. Uh, one of the more oldest, so I'm sorry if you're getting a little smoke here. Can you guys see all that? Oh no, that's good. Smoke is good, right? That's good. <laughs> all righty. We are about to sear this duck, so we're going to get some butter and a little oil in the pan. Um, and this beautiful duck is just about ready to go, so I've salt and peppered it. You want to make sure you liberally salt it, because what that salt does is it brings the moisture, brings the water to the surface, and allows you to brown the duck nicely. So we're going to get that in the pan. Get this other one in here. And then I'm going to liberally salt the flesh side as well, okay? And we're gonna add a little pepper in there with that. And basically all we're doing is getting some really nice color on the duck. We're starting the cooking process here because we're gonna finish it in the oven. And I wanna add another note about the canvas back duck. It was sought after also because of the flavor, mm -hmm. because the canvas back duck was known for eating off of the marsh and it gave a celery flavor to the meat. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when it was prepared, especially by the black culinarians here, they always paired it with celery in some form, fried yeah. celery, some type of celery puree or something added to it to bring out that natural celery flavor out of the duck. Yeah, and she's absolutely right because these wild duck migrated up and down, like I said, up and down um, from here to Canada. But when they came to Maryland, they were primarily feasting off of wild celery, which hence, gives these particular duck, the canvas back duck, their unique flavor. So you heard the of corn and all the other different kinds of things, the kinds of duck, you heard it first here. That's what I'm to give a mountain duck in American history and culture. So, I mean, this jerk sauce is a little unique. Um, you know, we are a sustainable operation, so we don't throw away anything. So we save everything that we can. So what I've done with this is I've incorporated a little oxtail jus in here. Um, it's like a reduction of oxtail that we've, um, I probably reduced it for about 16 hours. So that's in here with some fresh ginger, some garlic, um, some old spice that we toasted, um, a little Worcestershire, a little soy sauce, obviously brown sugar. Um, and we're big fans of blackstrap molasses here, so that's in. And then obviously, you can't have jerk without scotch bonnet peppers, um, so that's in there as well, a little tomato. Yeah, that kind of makes up our jerk sauce. So now that we have our main dish, it's time for some sides. And I know that we are really trying to make sure that we incorporate and honor our African traditions um, inside our food, because that's who we are. So what you got? All righty, so you know, we're talking about sides. We've already talked about the greens, the Liberian greens. So that's one. Now we're going to go straight back to Africa with jollof rice. Um, and if you're familiar with jollof, you know, we, we kind of use these principles as we talk about Juneteenth, and it kind of leads us straight into Kwanzaa. Those same principles exist. So when we talk about jollof, it represents the red, the blood. Uh, but more importantly, historically, um, jollof rice when you think about jollof rice, there are wars in Africa about jollof. Like here in America, we have mac and cheese wars, uh -huh. where there are jollof wars in Africa. Uh -huh. um, so I am no expert about jollof by no stretch of the imagination. So I'm gonna give you my interpretation of jollof. It's a very flavorful rice, but more importantly, it's probably the foundation of all the red rices that we see around the world. Whether you know it's a Mexican red rice or a Spanish paella or things of that nature, Jollof is probably the foundation of those rices, and it's very simple. Um, unique to us, um, something that's really culturally significant here in the United States. This is Carolina gold rice, um, and this rice was grown in South Carolina, uh, deep in the low country. But why it's significant to us, because most people think that when they were bringing the enslaved here from Africa, that they just pulled us out of the bush. That is far from the truth. They were looking for skilled tradesmen, and these rice growers were one of those people that grew this rice here. Um, and this is what we use here exclusively, um, Carolina gold rice. Very, very important to our culture. So let me get started while I'm talking. Let me get some butter working in this pan. We're gonna add in some fresh onion. Unique to mine is I add in fresh red pepper as well um, because I really like the influence of that flavor. Also some diced carrots. We're gonna get those in, add some earthiness to it. I have some garlic here. Just gonna smash that really quickly. Give it a nice little quick chop. 
And basically what we're doing now is just kind of caramelizing these, releasing the flavors from them, and then we're gonna get some tomato in there and some of our seasonings, and then we'll get our rice in. Huh? So I think we're close. And garlic in the pan. Ugh. Okay. It's the best. Smell a vision. Can you smell it? Can you? I just want you to. I'm sending the smells your way. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's smelling like Kwanzaa around here now. All right. So we know tomato season is not in, but we have beautifully uh, saved some tomato juice. And we're gonna get some of that in. And basically, what I'm doing is using that to kind of deglaze the pan to release all those beautiful seasonings and sugar from it. And then we're gonna get our rice in. I'm going to stir this rice in. Now, I use butter. Some people use ghee. You can use animal fat, whatever you prefer. At Heirloom here, we try to create our sides as vegan and vegetarian as much as possible. That way we can make as many people as happy as possible. Because typically, when you go to a southern restaurant, we are typically putting some type of meat or meat byproduct in our sides. We try to eliminate that here so we can make as many people happy as possible. So this gel off is not gonna have any meat proteins in it other than the butter that we use. Same thing with our greens, they're completely vegan and vegetarian. Yep, so this is the start of it here. And we're gonna let another, another suggestion if you go to some of the after stores, after shops, call the oil. Absolutely. One of the things that we even have here as well, it adds great flavor. It's, it's amazing, we actually watched them create call oil in Senegal when we were on our trip there. Yeah, great it's stuff. So so now it's something that we always keep on hand here all the time. <laughs> yeah, if you're creating African food, you should really be starting with African flavors. So um, if you really want to make something unique and not what you taste every day here, yeah, take a little trip to the African market, grab some of these really unique spices and uh, take it back to Africa. And you know, when you do that, you'll actually be celebrating the principle of Ujama Cooperative Economics, which means that you are supporting Black-owned businesses. And so that's how you can keep it Kwanzaa all year long. You don't have to wait until Kwanzaa, just only until Kwanzaa, to celebrate the Kwanzaa principles. You can celebrate them all year long. And you know, I want to ask you, because I know you are a Black-owned business that celebrates these principles and incorporates them in all that you do. How do you do that all year long? I, mean, I think it's just a, having a love for our people and having a love for our story. I think that is the most important part for us. Um, we love what we do um, and we believe the way that we express ourselves and tell our story is through food. Um, and I think it goes back to our ancestors because we never had any money. Um, our ancestors were denied of property here in the United States. So what we had was stories and we could tell those stories through our food. So. Um, that's how Heirloom um, chooses to represent that, and uh, um, we try to do that every day. So you know what? This is your next Creative Kwanzaa Challenge. I want you to think about how you can tell your story. We're talking about the principle of Nia, purpose. We all have purpose, and this is their favorite Kwanzaa principle. So Nia, purpose. How can you incorporate your purpose, your Nia, and what you do in a way that celebrates your culture, but also celebrates your own talent? Kwanzaa means first fruits of the harvest. And when we talk about harvest, man, we've got all kinds of wonderful things. But one of the things I want to celebrate is the corn. The corn represents the children who are the future, our future generations. And we actually are going to be making something with corn and also sweet potatoes. Not to be confused with yam. Break it down. Well, everybody understands yams and sweet potatoes to be one and the same, but that's far from the truth. Sweet potatoes are native to this country. Yams are not. Yams are something that we were used to in Africa. Um, but once we got here, we could not find yams. So sweet potato was the closest thing. So we started using sweet potatoes in, um, you know, in, you know uh, to replace the yam. So what happens when we mix corn, mm -hmm. sweet potatoes, eggs, seasonings? What do we get? Sweet potato cornbread. Hey now! <laughs> All right! Sweet potato, Sweet cornbread. potato cornbread. So that's, and this is what's in the bowl. It's all mixed up. I know you didn't see me do all the initial steps, but coming soon from Heirloom Food Group, we will be having my cornbread mix. And what we'll include on the packaging as well is how to turn the cornbread mix into sweet potato cornbread. That'll be included with the recipe. All right. 
we have the cornbread, um, and that's important. So we understand how corn gets processed down into the meal here. Um, so they take this corn, and as you can see, there are many different varieties and colors of corn. What we're using today is yellow corn. So um, this is a really nice corn here, but we're using a straight yellow corn. This has been fine milled down to pretty much cornmeal. So we're gonna take that. That's what she's using to make these sweet potato cornbread. And then along with that, you gotta have something to go with cornbread, right? So once again, we're gonna take it back to Africa. We've used hibiscus that we steep some uh, dried cranberries in, and then we take those and we puree them um, and get them to a really nice consistency. And then this is how we create our hibiscus and cranberry preserves. These are our Maryland sweet potato cornbread with a little hibiscus and cranberry preserves. You know, over the years, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture has been just a core part of helping us to celebrate our African American holidays, like Kwanzaa, like Black History Month, Dr. Martin Luther King Day, Juneteenth, and many others. It's a, it's a core part of our tradition, and it's been a core part of my life for the past 11 years, why? Because I love coming to the museum for all of the amazing celebrations we would have where you would see all of your family, all of your community celebrating our culture together. And so I just got this feeling every time I will come into the turn into you know the streets to get into Baltimore and then also come into the museum. I love it so much that I actually moved here and now I'm a resident of Baltimore which feels so good and I love meeting all of these black owned businesses and even though we're virtual this year we wanted you to just feel the same feeling that you felt when you come into the museum every year and we wanted to also celebrate some of the other amazing places in Maryland because we know it's not all about Baltimore so where are you from? Baltimore. <laughs> Baltimore born and raised then? Well I'm from Baltimore I've been born in Baltimore but I was raised where I grew up in Anne Arundel County. Okay, Anne Arundel County. So we're shouting out all the counties and I'm actually from Prince George's County and right. also lived in Charles County. So I wanna shout out all of the Maryland counties, wherever you are from the Eastern shore, all the way down to the Southern end of the county. We wanna shout you out and wish you a happy Kwanzaa uh, wherever you are in marvelous state of Maryland. So now it's time to get ready to set the Kwanzaa table. And here comes the right. beautiful part. Right. Are you guys ready to eat? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Been we're ready. Gonna, we're going to play some food. <laughs> Came ready. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get this beautiful gel up that we created here mm. in the bowl. Okay. Right. That's enough for us, right? All right, get that. All right, then we have our Liberian greens here. Yummy. We're going to get those into the bowl. So we've got the red and the green, the colors of Kwanzaa. And we're black, so we already got the black part. <laughs> yes. Ooh, yummy. Look at that. That looks so good. Yeah, it's gonna be a little spicy, but I think it'll be perfectly balanced, you know, with this and the greens. And we're gonna take a little bit of this and get that right on there. That spice will be okay. It'll warm us up this winter. Absolutely. <laughs> we're gonna take a little bit of that. Wow. You did that. You did that. That that right there, now I'm telling you, that's some Kwanzaa cooking. cooking. So now that we have our food, um, I want to give it up to our amazing chefs for this amazing, good looking Kwanzaa cooking. Yes. And now it's time for us to do my favorite part, which is Kwanzaa decorations. Let's get ready to set the Kwanzaa table. Here comes my favorite part. I love setting up the Kwanzaa table. And this is a part that you can really get everyone involved, from your children on to your elders. Collective work and responsibility is the principle that we are celebrating, which is Ujima. So one quick tip I want to tell you, when you're setting up your Kwanzaa table, um, your Kanara, which is the candle holder, 
It can be a little tricky with the candles to make sure that they stay in. So make sure you get candles that actually fit. And you can take uh, your lighter and put it on the bottom. Burn the bottom a little bit so that it can make your candles stay inside the canara for the duration of your ceremony. Now it's time to eat. Let's set up the Kwanzaa table. Ooh, it's going to be great. So these glasses are my mom's glasses, and we're starting the tradition now, passing things down from generation to generation, from her to me, and from me to our granddaughter. So that's the start of our tradition. And then these beautiful plates here, I know they look maybe look odd to some as a plate, um, but typically you would see um, plates like this being used. My wife and I took a trip to Senegal, Gambia last year, and while we were there, I was able to get this gentleman to carve these beautiful plates out of a fallen mahogany tree. So we have 10 of them in total that we brought back from Senegal and we're gonna use them as our plates today. Well, everybody, it has been a wonderful day celebrating Kwanzaa with you with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture and, of course, Heirloom, Baltimore's own Heirloom Food Group. So you know what? We're going to close out our Kwanzaa feast by saying Harambe, which means let's pull together. Ready? One, two, three. Harambe! 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 Harambe!